chapters where we're going to look in God's Word. In the nation of Iraq, for 24 years, Saddam Hussein ruled as a dictator with an iron fist, oppressing and torturing and killing his own people. We launched a war to bring Saddam down. One of the iconic pictures of the war in Iraq happened on April 10th, 2003 in Baghdad's Ferdo Square. Iraqis began trying to topple a 40-foot bronze statue of Saddam Hussein, but they were not able to. Some U.S. Marines came and wrapped a chain around Saddam's neck, attached it to a tank, and on that day, Saddam fell down. The Iraqis began to beat on Saddam with their shoes and their sandals. And many of you would have seen that, that photo. And some people say that this was actually a turning point in the, the Iraqi minds. They finally began to grasp that Saddam had come down. In the scripture that we're going to read, Jesus says... I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And as we are gathered in this conference, this is actually our call, is that we are to make Satan fall in all the different places where we labor for the Lord. I want to preach about making Satan fall. We see in this scripture three principles about this. Read with me in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others also, sent them two by two before his face into every city, in the place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no one by the road. Skip down, you can read the whole chapter in your own time. Verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject uh, to us in your name. Verse 18, he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Making Satan fall. I want to look at the first principle in making Satan fall, and that's the principle of sending. Verse 1, Jesus said that he appointed them, and here is the great principle of calling that God makes a choice for their lives. This involves purpose. I don't know what the 70 were doing before this time, but God Almighty had a plan and a purpose for them. This involved places. The Bible says they were going to places that Jesus himself chose. And then there are people. There were specific people that they were going to reach in those places. But the Bible says here that involved in this is the principle of sending. Verse 1, he sent them. Verse 2, pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth labors. And verse 3, he says, I send you. Sending is the life of discipleship. When there is a call and a purpose of God, disciples will aim their lives. They will order their lives are at the will of God. And they will give themselves for this purpose if they believe that they will be sent. This is a very important uh, principle. They must see other people being sent from their local congregation. 
The Bible gives us a principle, and it is the principle of flow. In the Garden of Eden, there were no lakes, but the Bible says there were four rivers. Jesus says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and Luke says, give, and it shall be given. In other words, life comes from flow. This is profound in the area of discipleship because discipleship will have no life without sending. This is the end result that, uh, in, that someday uh, disciples be sent to reproduce the will of God and their mother church. And the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 14, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to, to preach. Discipleship must be more than classes. It must be more than helping or setting things up. Jesus said that he called them, he appoints them as disciples so that he might send them. And if ever we fail to send or stop sending, then we stop the life and the motivation of discipleship. This is the problem. Sometimes you have pastors, they are fearful of sending out a church or there's a financial risk or they don't want to lose the ministry that these disciples have or the money that they have. So they spend their time sending and painting and polishing and buffing and they say they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. The problem is, without the principle of sending, couples will not continue to aim their lives at the will of God. If Satan is going to fall, there must be sending in our churches. Sending is also the power of discipleship. You know, it's human nature that the strong will, uh, or, or the, the weak will let the strong carry the weight. How many of you have ever helped move? You know what I'm talking about. You know, you are of uh, average size, and then there's big beefer man. You know what happens when they're carrying something heavy. Oh, you, you put on the, uh, but really it's like, let beef man carry it. And that's true in a local church. Is that people will let strong disciples carry the weight. And they will hold back, they will coast and not rise. Sending is what stirs life in the church because others are forced to rise or they're stirred to rise. It may be that they say if God could use him, this is what brings flow, is sending. Sending is also the authority of ministry. In verse 1, he says, first of all, he sent them then he tells them there is going to be sometimes lack of response and people who will reject you. Because Jesus knew, this is very important, before he tells them the bad news about ministry, the Bible says specifically, he sent them first. Because Jesus knew what rejection and lack of response would produce in their mind. Number one, it produces intimidation. Intimidation means to make small or to overawe, to make afraid. In other words, this is the voice, whether it's inside your head or out of the mouth of someone else, that says, who do you think you are? What do you think that you're doing? You don't have what it takes. Jeremiah said, I am only a child. Goliath, the Bible says, he despised him, for he was but uh, a youth. When Lisa and I went to Launceston, Tasmania in 1986, I was 21, she was 19, we both looked like we were 12. <laughs> went to this place and I would have a lot of money if I had money for every time that someone came into the church and they would look around and they would look at us and then they would ask this question with a sneering voice, and who is the pastor here? I am. Uh, yeah, I, I am. 
and they would look disdainfully. But you see, I had been sent. This means something. I never even heard of this place. In the absence of a clear voice from God, I chose out of an almanac, out of an atlas, looking at uh, cities of a certain size. The day that I chose, we went out to lunch an hour and a half later, and at lunch, someone said, this city, I never even heard of it two days before. They said, I'm praying for Launceston, Tasmania. We need a church there. The night after we were announced to go in the concert scene, a girl got saved. You got to understand, Launceston is 3,000 miles away from where I was uh, uh, at, where we were being sent from. They said, you're not going to believe. You know where this girl is from? She's from Launceston. And so when these people would sneer and ask, who's the pastor? Say, it doesn't matter, Mr. Religious Fruity Toes. I was sent... Second thing that happens in the problems of ministry is that we measure our calling by response. Jesus says sometimes things aren't going to go well and you're going to be rejected. And the conclusion that some people reach when those normal things happen is, I shouldn't be here, I must not be called. John the Baptist he sent a message with a question to Jesus. Are you sure you're the one? Because things aren't going well. That is normal that these things come in our mind. Went to Johannesburg in, in uh, 1997. When he went there, the place where we wanted to start and I had in mind, couldn't find housing. I went to that area after we found a house elsewhere to try to rent a hall, and very violently the man said, no, we will not let you have a church here. I was forced to open. We opened in another area, and then shortly after opening, they announced to us that that hall would be uh, not available for some two months. But you see, again, I was sent. I was sent. I was in my office in Melbourne, Australia, and I was minding my own business. Had no one to Africa wasn't on my radar. And after we just had a tremendous revival, the next night I'm sitting in my office rejoicing at what God was doing. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to go to Johannesburg, South Africa. Sending is a profound issue in uh, uh, making Satan fall because the person who is sent can have confidence. Being sent means that we have Sanction. Sanction means authority that gives support for an action. Nehemiah 2 verse 7, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they permit me to pass through until I come to Judah. Nehemiah went. He had letters. He was sent by the king when there's opposition he understood he had sanctioned. That means that if we are sent to do God's will, that God will support us, that God will supply what we lack to carry out his will. Sir Henry Stanley, when he went on an expedition to Africa to find David Livingston, his journey was not going well. They were attacked much of their supplies had been stolen. And so with an African tribal chief, he was told what you need to do is you need to cut a covenant, cut a blood covenant with this chief. And so he did. But part of this covenant, the chief took his goat. Henry Stanley had ulcers and he had to have this goat. They milked it daily for his ulcers. This is how he's going to survive. And this chief demands as the price of covenant demanded, literally, he got his goat. And in exchange, he gave him a seven-foot spear that was wrapped in copper. That's what every Englishman needs, is a seven-foot spear. He, look at this. Oh, this is great. But the next village that they went into, when they saw the spear, they all fell and bowed down. 
And they asked him, what do you need? He said, I need a goat. And they gave him a whole herd of goats. And everywhere he went, he had sanctioned. He did not realize that was the most powerful chief in the entire area. I want to tell you something. That is the power of being sent. That you go. There's not just a program where we just happen to announce some names and happen to slap hands on people. Listen to me. Being sent is a powerful thing. That heaven will back you up. There are people that you're in the ministry. You've come this week. You've come dragging in. Because life and the devil and people, they've been chewing on you. Listen to me. You need to recapture a vision of being sent. Do you remember what it's like to be called? This is why Paul writes to Timothy, who's going through many struggles and numbers of the verses in 1 Timothy. He is reminding him of what God has done in his calling, 1 Timothy 4.14, do not neglect the, the spiritual gift you received to the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, I know things are not going well right now, but you were sent. Oh, listen, we need a revival of calling. To remember back, God, I was sent here, yes. Right now, things might not be going like I would like them to, but I was sent. And that means something. Let's talk about a second principle. It's the principle of spirit. In our scripture, in verse 4, Jesus tells us, if you're going to make Satan fall, he tells us what not to take. Money, bag, naps, or money bag, knapsack, and sandals. In other words, he's talking about equipment. Now, some people in doing a work for God, they focus on the outside or they focus on what they take with them. In their mind, that is absolutely paramount. My equipment. There are people that are sitting here right now and in ministry, you're still seething in bitterness because you have been thinking in your mind, I could have had revival if I had a good projector. <laughs> this is true. I'm not making this up. Well, of course he had revival. He had the good PA system. They got the good building. They got the good evangelist. And so their focus is on outs outside. Jesus, in telling them what not to take, he's not anti-equipment. The scripture is not an excuse for cheap pastors. Okay, that's why we're sending you with nothing. Because the Bible says so. But rather, Jesus wants them to focus on their spirit. He's pointing out to them what you have on the inside is the most important. Our scripture has a companion passage in Matthew 10.10. 10, and I like it in the message translation, which is actually a transliteration. But these almost the same words in Matthew 10.10 10 in the message says, you don't need a lot of equipment because you are the equipment. That is actually what Jesus is trying to capture. You know, the Marines, they have a, a creed that they... Uh, uh, recite in, in their training, for basic training, when they give them their weapon, when they give their rifle, and they say words like this, my rifle is my best friend, it is my life. They say, I will ever guard it against the ravages of weather and damage, like I guard my legs, my arms, my eyes, my heart against damage. I will keep my rifle clean and ready. They understand this. This is going to determine whether we live or die. But Jesus is not talking about your rifle. He's talking about your heart. He's talking about your spirit here. And Jesus is saying here that literally you are the equipment. The absolute focus here. You are sent. That is focusing on God. But secondly, you are the equipment. 
What is on the inside is critical. Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. 1 Peter 2, 11, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. He says, listen, there are things you can let in on the inside. They will go to war inside of you. They will begin to break down and change things. Spiders, when they catch their prey, whether this is insects, some spiders can even catch uh, 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 lizards or birds, uh, things that are larger than them. Spiders don't eat their prey. In other words, they don't with their teeth devour them. What they do is they inject poison that goes to work inside and it literally digests from the inside out so that they are then able to suck that out. That scripture in 1 Peter 2.11 says, listen, there are things if you allow ungodliness and carnality on the inside in whatever form it comes this is going to work to change something. You ever meet carnal Christians and you look at some of the decisions they're making? It's like, what, what were you thinking? You know what a carnal Christian is? They're just partially digested. <laughs> they're allowing things in. Things are changing. And on the outside, may look, Jesus says, you are the equipment. We see a puzzling instruction here in verse 20. Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, Baptists will take that scripture and they'll say, see, that shows you're not supposed to have anything supernatural. Salvation is all you need. Salvation, that's it. That is not what Jesus is saying. The point of that verse is this. If you are the equipment, if your heart, your spirit is crucial, Jesus is saying don't focus so much on what you can do that you forget what you are. In other words, your heart being right with God, your spirit is going to be the most critical factor of all. This tells us it is possible to be doing right things but our hearts not be right with God. It is possible to do right things and yet have a completely funky spirit. The elder brother, the Bible says he is laboring in the field. That is good. That's where he should be. That's what he should be doing. That is good and that is right. The problem is, on the inside, <clears throat> he is filled with bitterness and entitlement that is clouding his spirit. Philippians 1.15, it's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. The preaching is good, but their spirit is not right. Jesus said to some of the disciples, you know not what spirit you're of. I remember many, many years ago here in conference, Pastor Mitchell was praying for the sick. I, I have no idea who it was. I don't think I was even living here, but Pastor Mitchell prayed for a pastor. He had some kind of injury or pain, and Pastor Mitchell asked him the famous question, who do you hate? And the pastor said, my whole church. <laughs> what we are on the inside. See, here's the problem. Even as men of God, as workers and laborers for God, we can be doing right things, but become blinded by familiarity by success, by pride, by rebellion, and our hearts be completely off track. 
Isaiah said the words, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Peter said, Depart from me, from me for I am a sinful man. These were not people that got off the street. These were people who were already involved with the things of God, but they recognized there are some things on the inside that I have to take care of. So this means our constant priority is to take care of our own hearts. The priests in the Old Testament, they were given instructions. They had a brass laver. Literally, this was a basin. And the Bible tells us specifically what it was made of is that women donated their brass mirrors and so out of those mirrors, God had, had them make this water basin. And before they were to go into the presence of God or do something for God, number one, many scholars believe that this would have been polished. So not only did it hold water, but they would see themselves. And the priority is see yourself so you can cleanse yourself so that you can minister effectively. That is our call. I don't care how long you've been saved or how much experience that you have. This is our call. Jesus says here, you are sent, but as you are sent, make sure of your spirit. That is critical in our consistent relationship with God and our honest heart examination. Let's look at one final principle of making Satan fall, and that has to do with the supernatural. Jesus is honest about the obstacles and difficulties they're going to face. He lists them in some detail. Wolves, if they refuse you, if they reject you, demons, serpents, and scorpions. He says, this is going to be a part, I don't care how talented you are, how wonderful you are. He says, you are going to face lack of response, people difficulties, resistance, and demonic opposition. Mark it down, it's built in, part and parcel of doing a work for God. Are these things, you want a word from God? You want to, I'll give you a word. You will face big demons big problems and mean people. Thus saith the Lord. That's just the way it is. Now, the mistake that we can make when we face these things is to look at those common problems only through natural eyes or on a natural level. The reason why I'm having these problems, it's this city. It's these people. It's this economy. And that's why these problems are coming. But you see, Jesus understands something. Life and ministry cannot be understood purely on a natural level. If you look at these problems that he's honest about and you only measure that with natural eyes, you're going to see things. You're going to add up incorrectly. Think about Job. The Bible says in Job's experience, enemies steal his finances. Weather destroys his property. A storm kills his children. He has physical sickness and there's conflict in the home. And if you would look at that only on a natural level, then you could say, well, yes, that's because there's mean people, freak weather, people do get sick, you know, and his wife rides a broom, of course. <laughs> but you see, the Bible... allows us to see into another dimension. 
These are all the things that you can see with the natural eye, but God lets us see into the spiritual realm that in fact Satan had gained access uh, <coughs> into his life. There was a supernatural root to some of his natural problems. Malachi 3, there are financial reversals and lack that are happening to some of God's people. But God says it is a spiritual problem. It is the devourer. And he personifies a, 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 a spirit that, that is resisting them. Now listen to me right here. In every sending scripture in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have uh, different uh, sending scriptures. In every sending scripture in the Gospels, all of them refer to authority and power over demon spirits. Every single one of them. Because this is the only way that you can understand some of the things you're going to go through. And this is the only way that you can truly make Satan fall. If you understand your scent, which is profound, if you take care of your spirit, which you should, you cannot stop there. Jesus says, and I'm giving you power over serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. In other words, we have to approach life and ministry with a supernatural perspective or spiritual eyes. You have to see life and you have to see ministry with spiritual eyes because if you don't, you're going to wind up accepting things that you were never meant to accept. You're going to see the thing, yep, that, well, that, that's, that, and that's why. Therefore, that's the way it is here. You're going to have things that you are not meant to have. Think about Paul in Acts 16. <clears throat> the Bible says that they're laboring in a new area for the Lord. Here's the girl that has a spirit of divination. We, we uh, learned this, but Paul doesn't know that. He hadn't read the Bible yet, right? We know that. All he knows is there's a crazy woman following them around on outreach, screaming. Now, I've been to some cities. It's like there, there are a lot of crazy people here. You can look at it and say, That's, I'm not surprised. But we understand, and the Bible says, this she did many days. This didn't just happen just one day. It's like, wow, that was a bummer. That kind of wrecked the outreach. The Bible says this went on and on and on. And the Bible says, finally, being grieved or vexed in his spirit, he turned, this is, this is from hell. And he rebukes it there. In other words, that spirit could be cast out. Didn't have to be that way. Jesus says, there are some things that are going to happen. Every, I don't care how great you are. <clears throat> there will be people problems. There will be opposition. There are going to be these problems. But the issue is, is spiritual sometimes in root. It doesn't have to be that way. I hear people say things like, as soon as we get a good convert, another church comes and snatches them. As soon as we get ahead financially, something breaks or some tragedy happens financially. As soon as we start to get momentum in our church, somebody backslides or somebody rebels. Or when I come back from being out of town into my city, it's like something sits on me, weighs on me. Or when I drive up to my church, as soon as I drive up, I start to get headaches. Or every time we have a revival, someone gets sick. And this is why Jesus says, listen, listen, that's not normal. That's not just life. That's just the way it is. That's our city. He says, listen, 
There are serpents and scorpions involved here. Verse 19, he says, I give you the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Here's two supernatural elements every worker for God is going to have to face. Number one, there's serpents. This is talking about the power of witchcraft. That literally, someone is using evil supernatural power to resist God's will or God's people. 2 Timothy 3.8, now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses. So here, Paul is now writing to a New Testament church. He refers back to Moses in Egypt. He names, you remember when Moses came and announces God's will, I'm here because I was sent. God says, let my people go. Why should I? He throws down his staff, turns into a serpent. And here the New Testament names Janus and Jambres that they withstood. How did they withstand? They threw down their staves and they turned into serpents. This was supernatural power of witchcraft. And that word withstood, we get our word antihistamine from this. This is a medicine that inhibits or negates histamine in the body. So the, here Paul is, is writing here, and he says, I, I want you to understand something, Timothy, is that you are going to face supernatural power that is going to try to inhibit your labors, your prayers, your righteousness, all that you're trying to do for God. This is supernatural. Now, I do not mean that every problem in life is witchcraft. We got a flat tire. That's because it's a flat tire demon. I understand there are some normal things that happen in life. But listen to me. There are, there are some of you here that you're trying to labor for God. Things happen over and over and over. And you're looking only on a natural level. And God is going. It does, listen, serpent, score. It doesn't have to be that way. There are people that are supernaturally opposing you. He speaks secondly about scorpions. Scorpions actually have to do with words that are spoken against us. In Ezekiel 2 verse 6, son of man, don't be afraid of them or afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and though you dwell among scorpions. Don't be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Here in this scripture, he links clearly scorpions have to do with words of people that are opposing you. These are words that are spoken against you. There are workers and laborers and pastors that you have come dragging into conference. Your mind is con confused. You are oppressed and tormented. There are some of you that you have not viewed your headship or your pastor uh, 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 correctly. You are suspicious and there are all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, problems that are going on uh, in your mind. And the real issue is you haven't been the same on, uh, since someone spoke to you. Because the devil is masterful at sending someone, whether these are Words of unbelief. Our scripture in Ezekiel links it to a rebellious house. There's something about rebellion that the devil will make sure some sweet rebellious soul will make sure that they say some words. And that the real problem is you got bit by a scorpion in your mind. And that's why that's on your mind. Jesus says this is not normal. It's not natural. It's supernatural and you have to look at life that way. <coughs> Our call is to make Satan fall. Jesus is honest about the things that we face. There's no one that you're going to be able to avoid this. But our call is to make Satan fall. Literally to overcome the powers of hell in your city, in your situation, in your church, whatever it might be. Verse 19, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. 
That word tread, this is aggressive trampling or aggressive stomping so that you crush something. Listen, if there was a snake on this stage or there was a scorpion on this stage and I had no other way to get rid of it, listen, I wouldn't be playing with it. He said, you, you to tread, this is to aggressively stomp so that you crush it. Now, this is not a formula. Jesus doesn't give a, if you will say these words, if you will do this. That's not what he's, what he's actually after. What he really is after, this is a posture. This is a way of approaching things supernaturally. That's what Paul did. Finally, he got aggressive with hell, and he said, come out. That's what prayer is all about. It's not about you say these words. Binding, all that literally means is that in some way, in some area of your life, your church, your ministry, your finances, your health, your family, whatever it is, binding is simply that you say, no, no more. I'm not putting up with that. And God says, when you do that, I will back you up. Had a young pastor that called me last week. He's new in the ministry. He said, Pastor, we had some services that were really low. And so I got some of the council members together. And I said to them, have you noticed the services are low? He said, we're not putting up with that. We're not going to stand for that. And I think if I remember right, that they fasted that day. And, and when they fasted, he said, that night, they had some people that had been missing for a long time come, had a number of visitors. When it was all done, they had nine people saved. Because that is a posture. In other words, it is approaching life with spiritual eyes. And when you recognize the evidence of a spiritual problem, that you exercise the authority that God has given you. My parents, when they went to Wickenburg, Arizona, this was the first church they ever pastored. They had, the church had never uh, supported a pastor. They struggled financially. And Dad said that when he began to look at God's word, particularly looking at Malachi, and he got a revelation about the devourer, he began to understand there is something that is supernatural that is holding back finances that we ought to have to do the work of God. He said that he went to the church in the morning alone and he prayed and rebuked the devourer. He said, devil, get your hands off the finances that God has ordained for this church and his people. He said a little bit later that morning when he went home, a woman came to the door and she said, I was sitting at home and I remembered that we had sold something and I never paid tithes and she gave 11 $100 bills. This is in 1961. That was huge money. A little bit later in the day, another woman came and she said, I remembered that I had forgotten to tithe on something and she gave $300. And he said, from that time, that church always supported financially. Jesus says, listen, that is the birthright of every worker. Every child of God, you have the right. When there are things that are not the will of God, that you have the right to say no, that's... That might be coming against it, witchcraft. That might come against words or whatever it might be. But God says, I will back that up with supernatural power. I close this story. Rodney Lambert gave me this story. He said in 2001, Pastor Mitchell preached a sermon here in conference on witchcraft and church growth. He wrote me this email. He said, God spoke to me through Pastor Mitchell's sermon that someone had cursed the church in Safford, Arizona, where he was pastoring. i have been there five years. Nothing was happening. They were not getting anyone saved. He said, 
he went home and preached a version of that in his own church. Right after that, he said, I had a confrontation with a witch in a JB's restaurant. He said, I was witnessing to one of the cooks on his break. I said to him, Jesus loves you, sitting at the table next to us with her back turned. When I said, Jesus loved you, she said loud enough for us to hear, no, he doesn't. I said, Jesus can change your life. She said, no, he can't. I said, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And she said, no, he didn't. So I got mad. I told her, be quiet. Get out of my conversation. She said she would pray for me. And I told her, I'm going to send the curse right back on you. Listen. One of the disciples there in the church remembered the sermon on witchcraft that I just preached on Sunday. He said, Pastor, do you know who that is? She's the biggest witch in town. Right after that, they went to the church, pleading the blood of Jesus, praying at the church. And he said within six months, they had six large families added to the church supernaturally. <laughs> supernaturally. This is the birthright of every believer and every worker that you have been sent. And if you will deal with the issues in your spirit, you have the right to bring supernatural power and authority to bear in your situation. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place.